Brigadier General Rafael Del Pino's passion, dedication, and perseverance in his flying career played a very important role in the development of the Cuban Air Force during the Cold War. Born on 22 September 1938 in Piñar del Rio, Cuba, Brigadier General Rafael Del Pino grew up with a strong passion for the aviation world. In 1958, he joined Castro's guerrillas to fight for freedom with whom he fought until the triumph of the revolution on January 1, 1959. After the national uprising, Del Pino decided to join the Cuban Air Force, where he began his flying training. In April 1961, Del Pino received his baptism of fire, flying 10 combat missions in 72 hours, resulting in the downing of two B-26 light bombers and the sinking of several vessels during the Bay of Pigs invasion. For these impressive air performances, he was declared a hero of Playa Giron by Fidel Castro. During the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 1962, his accomplishments earned him the title of Air Force Assistant to Fidel in the Cuban Central Command Post. After commanding the country's largest Air Force base, Del Pino traveled to the Soviet Union for advanced aerial training, where he flew almost every Soviet combat aircraft available. He also attended one of the most prestigious military institutions, the Soviet Air Force's Yuri Gagarin War College, where he graduated in 1965. In 1966, Del Pino was appointed the General Director of Cuban de Aviación after the military intervention of the National Airline. He flew commercial aircraft such as the Ilyushin IL-14 for two years before rejoining the Cuban Air Force. Del Pino went on to serve two tours in Vietnam, first in 1968 as an advisor to the North Vietnamese fighter pilots and a second tour in 1975 inside South Vietnam where he experienced the collapse of Saigon to the Viet Cong. After Vietnam, Del Pino participated in Cuba's first major international military intervention in Africa, commanding the air forces of the Cuban Expeditionary Force in Angola. In 1983, Del Pino was promoted to the rank of Brigadier General, being assigned as Deputy Chief of the Cuban Air Force and Air Defenses. In the last part of his military career, General Del Pino gradually became frustrated with Castro's refusal to implement political reforms in the island. So, in May 1987, he decided to break away from the regime and fled with his family to the United States. With more than 9,000 flying hours from commercial aircraft to military fighters and great experience as a military leader, Brigadier General Del Pino defines himself as a man who loves aviation at all costs. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the entire gathering of Eagles teams, we are honored to bring you Brigadier General Rafael Del Pino, interviewed by Major Cesar Acebes. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you. Great. Sir, thank you very much for being here with us. This is a privilege. I think we all share the same opinion. Thank you for sharing with us your personal experience through all your military career. And the, the whole goal of this interview is that we can learn from your experience uh, to become a better officer in the future. Sir, in some of your books, you define yourself as a man who loves aviation at all times. Well, what, what motivated you to join the Cuban Air Force and become a pilot? Yes. Well, uh, before anything, I want to thank you for, for this invitation, and I want to thank all of you for letting me to share the, the experience of 40 years in, uh, in the Air Force in Cuba. Uh, about the, what motivated me, uh, Flying was not me since I was a child. And I remember one day I was in, in my high school classroom and I watched through the window a beautiful yellow Piper Cup J3 approaching the, the wrong way of my le, a small airport in my hometown. So I, I look at that and say, oh my God, what is that? That's what, 
that's what I want to be. So <clears throat> when the bell rang, I, I went on running to the airport to see the, that beauty. And when I got there, the, the pilot, I met the pilot. He had just arrived to my hometown to make a living, giving a ride in, a, in his, his airplane. And after that, I was locked on that idea. And every afternoon after, after class, I run to the airport. And a few days after, I, I make a, a proposal to to my new friend and say, hey, uh, uh, why don't you uh, use uh, an assistant? Uh -huh. <laughs> he looked at me that like way and say, well, you know, you, <clears throat> you are having some difficulty with, the, with your client because you have to uh, <clears throat> start the engine with, with hand because the, the, J, uh, the, J, uh, the J3 uh, didn't have uh, Start the bottom, so, and then you have to take take off the the chart from the in front of the of the wheel, and I can do that. <laughs> work. Besides, I can clean the, the the plane. I can put fuel in it, uh, change oil. I can do everything for, for free. He look at me, he say, "Hey kid, there is nothing. <laughs> there is not a launch for free in this world." What do you want? Say, well, I noticed that most of your clients, uh, they pay for an hour, for 30 minutes, and in 20 minutes they're asking you to go down because they get sick. And, and uh, even one time I saw someone vomiting on, you know, on your back. <laughs> <laughs> I can clean too. Okay. <laughs> so, then he say, okay, uh, let's cut a deal. I, I will do it, and you are going to start uh, flying. I was 13 years old. 13 years old. Yeah. And <clears throat> then after that day, I, w <clears throat> I traveled every afternoon to the airport, uh, and not, not every day I could uh, do it, but he always, had a reserve, a leftover minutes, and at the end he always come out. And he was such a nice person. And after a, about five weeks, I, I already was feeling good in the airplane. And I, I remember very well because this was my birthday. It was the, the September 22nd. Even my mother have uh, prepared some small party for me in home, and I, I got late because I, I went to the to the airport and to do the uh, the usual thing. I mean, after the the client, so that day he after the the client said, "Okay, let's go," and <clears throat> we went to the the head <clears throat> of the wrong way and he released his belt, he went out, okay. he said, listen, <laughs> this is your time. I said, what? <laughs> yeah, you are ready. I am ready for what? For your first solo flight? Are you sure? Then I, <laughs> then he <clears throat> said, are you afraid? I said, no, 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 I'm not afraid, but the thing is that you have surprised me. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, ah, come on. With 13 years old? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> He, <clears throat> he oh, oh, and I said, okay. I went for the, for the first uh, traffic. Uh, he was in the, uh, in the middle of the runway. Uh, then I landed, and he signed on me, another one. <laughs> I won again, I, another one, three. Then <clears throat> he was waiting for me with some friends and uh, the sister to cut my shirt and <laughs> put, uh, uh, oil over me and <laughs> oh, wow. and then the problem was to go back home. I mean, I said, uh, my mother, uh, yeah. they didn't know what I was doing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I What's said, next to him? Yeah, so I, I, I went back home and 
Uh, my mother uh, was mad at me and said, hey, today's your birthday. Ah, oh, what happened to you? you oh, I, again, a fight in the school. No, I'm not that. I was with, with a friend. What a friend. <laughs> I was with uh, yeah, She said, you got a girlfriend. What happened? No, well, yeah, I say, well, yeah, yeah, I got a good friend. I was with her today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, yeah, why did, did you bring it? Well, she's too, too big to yeah. fix. <laughs> it doesn't fit in the house. Fix by the, by the door. Yeah. <laughs> you say, uh, and, and how is she? Well, uh, she's yellow. A Chinese? <laughs> Chinese. A Chinese? No, 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 no. No, no, it's... <laughs> It's just uh, yeah, the lipstick. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> and <clears throat> I, I was very happy. I, I, the, the following days, and I kept flying. <laughs> and a few months later, uh, something interrupted my my happiness. With uh, it was um, a political event. A, a general named Batista came out with a, with a coup d'etat, and all, all the children went to the street because he interrupted the, the democratic path of Cuba. And I, I went with, the, with my friend uh, to protest the, the event, and uh, we were repressed and beaten and arrested, and when I get home with uh, my <laughs> head broken and <laughs> blood, my father said, no, oh, <clears throat> this is it. Uh, my family, <clears throat> I come from, from a Baptist family, mm -hmm. and my father had a good relation with the Southern Baptist Convention. He immediately called here to the, uh, his friend in the U.S. and said, well, I have to take my, my kid out of Cuba because this is going to be bad. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> uh, Three or four days later, uh, later, I was in an airplane heading for Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, so <clears throat> I that that was my first time in the United States, okay. and I finished high school, and then went back to, uh, to Cuba. And of course, uh, as soon as I arrived in Cuba again, for uh, three years later, but I joined my old friends. And I joined the resistance, uh -huh. and after that, I joined the rebel army uh, in the mountains, and I ended the civil war as a first lieutenant. Uh -huh. Okay, sir. After the revolution in 1959, you joined the Cuban Air Force. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us how was your initial flight training? <laughs> what kind of challenges did you face at that time? Oh, yes. <clears throat> when I entered the, the gates of the Cuban Air Force headquarters, there was chaos and disorganization. Well, in any revolution uh, at the beginning is, is like that. And, but on top of that, <coughs> uh, Castro had um, fired all the, the old pilot of the Batista regime. Okay. So he only left a small group of about 12 pilots that they were in prison because they were conspiring against Batista. Those were uh, the pilot <coughs> uh, more prepared, more professional. They even were graduated in the United States, uh -huh. in Nellis Air Force Base. And, and he said, well, uh, uh, he, he was going to let them stay. But what happened? They, they were 11. 11 old pilot, a very good pilot. Uh, Captain Carrera was the, uh, the, uh, the chief of all of them. He was, he was the first Latin American pilot who flew the F-86 Sabre. Uh -huh. And well, but the thing is that they have to be appointed to the different command position. And no one could uh, take the, the burden of the training. And <clears throat> I, I, uh, I was looking for, the, for training. And, and when I get there, uh, <clears throat> they, they had uh, hired 
civilian pilot to do the training uh, from Cuba and uh, also a group of uh, civilian pilots from, from Chile. Mm -hmm. And we start a very disorganized uh, training. Uh, uh, I start flying the ATC uh, 86 Texan, mm -hmm. then the the T-28 Trojan, then the, from there I, uh, I, I flew the the F, uh, the P-47 Thunderbolt, the P-51 Mustang, the um, C Fury MK-11, that, that was the last uh, fighter uh, built by, uh, by the British. It okay. was very good at plane, I mean, very powerful. And, and also the TVM Avenger, because we had uh, in Cuba, we have uh, Navy aviation, and Fidel decided to consolidate all, all the, the Air Force in, in one, so they gave us the order. That they, he closed the, the, naval, the, the naval aviation, and we had to go there and pick up the, the TBM, the Avenger, and bring it to the San Antonio Air Force Base, and, and three PBY Catalin. And <clears throat> so, but uh, as I told you, uh, the, the training was in uh, in a year. We were uh, about 19 young officers, and 50% uh, got killed. Got killed. Okay. Yeah, we lost four Sea Fury. We lost three uh, Thunderbolt and two uh, ATC-6. Then, <clears throat> Captain Carreras and Captain Prendes, they were the most, most professional. They, uh, they asked the, the commander of the Air Force, hey, if, if we let this, these people doing like that, they, they want to get killed, uh, all of them. So he <clears throat> decided to, uh, he request to organize a, a crash course for for all of the for the rest of the pilot and include some some other at, uh, for the the uh, the pilot that um, could uh, uh, go uh, uh, make the transition to the to the T33 mm -hmm. that that was the uh, the jet so they organized a, a very good uh, class course uh, that was a success we we were feeling very well. And we were getting close to the day of the invasion of the invasion, but then we had another crisis that was hard because uh, the most mature um, pilot already they started they, they they were more experienced and they started criticizing the, the way in which Castro was. Uh, turning to, to the communism, uh, and they were, hey, what is going on here? Uh, uh, he is deceiving us because we, we all fight uh, uh, for democracy and this, and they were expressing too openly, and <clears throat> but you know, they have more, more uh, knowledge of, of political science, uh, and, but it was a small group where I was that we were only concentrating in the, in our uh, uh, <clears throat> goal to become a pilot, and, and one morning we wake up and they, uh, they, most of them have been arrested, and then uh, only eight pilots left. Carreras Prende uh, and another, uh, Fernandez, yeah, eight pilots. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, during the, the Bay of Peak we were only eight, eight pilots. Sir, talking about the Bay of Pigs, after only two years from your initial training, you had your first combat experience. Can you tell us how do you prepare for those missions? What kind of intelligence do you have from the enemy forces? Yes. Uh, well, let me tell you my, my first uh, confrontation with Castro. Uh, a few days before the Bay of Pig, we were receiving a, a lot of uh, armament, uh, armored tank, uh, um, armored vehicle, uh, gun, big guns, uh, 122 millimeter. And one day 
he, he was touring, assessing the, the armament that was, uh, had been storage in, the, in San Antonio because San Antonio was very close to, to the bay where, uh, where the, the Soviet ship uh, bring the, all the, this weapon. So uh, he went there, he was looking at, uh, at, the, uh, at the big guns and Bausa, another pilot, and me, we went over there and uh, we, we asked, sir, sir, excuse me, sir. <laughs> we see that we have receiving tank, uh, armored car, big gun, we're not going to receive the me. He said, who is, it? he looked at me, it's me, sir, I'm a, oh, me, me. You know, in, in Spanish, if uh, me, M-I-G, if you change the last word for yes. L, it's me, it's southern. Yes. <laughs> so he used a, 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 a play of word, say, me, 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 cows, <laughs> a southern cow is what I'm going to bring here, because you, the pilot, uh, you think you are better than anybody, uh, than anybody else, and you are arrogant and say, well, this man's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look what happened with the other guy that were criticizing the revolution and this and that and that. And, and, you, and then he, he said, and you know what? The first bomb that hit the ground here, oh, you are going to run. And, and then I, I, couldn't, I couldn't help it. said, you are wrong, sir. You are wrong. Then the bodyguard came. <laughs> and then he said, wait, 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 wait. Why do you think that I am wrong? Say, I don't know if we are going to be alive, but if any of, any of us is alive here, we are going to take off and we, will, I, we are going to confront the attacker no matter what. On the fire, no matter what, we're going to do it. Then he say, what? We'll see. But then he, he realized, realized that he had been rude. And that we didn't accept that. So he came around and said, you know, I was trying to elevate the spirit. Say, so, okay. but I don't like the way you elevate. I was, I don't know how I, they didn't arrest me because I couldn't have that. I say, I don't like the way you elevate the spirit, sir. Okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> During the Bay of Pigs, you shot down two aircrafts. And then uh, Fidel actually nominated you for, for a hero, uh, Playa Giron hero. So obviously that helped you in the relationship after that. <laughs> Transition, sir, to this critical moment of history. In 1962, you work as the Air Force assistant to Fidel Castro yeah. um, at the command post during the Cuban Peninsula Crisis. I was, uh, in that moment, I, I was in San Antonio, I was the, the commander of one squadron of MiG-19. And uh, I was called to the Air Force headquarters. Then the, the commander of the Air Force told me, hey, get your things. You got to go to the central commanding post, the general commanding post with the commander in chief. I say, what? Why me? Well, uh, Castro asked for you. I say, well, he knows I am uh, a storm and I'm blended. <laughs> Why me? Why? I don't know. Then he said, maybe because of that, he wants you there. So <clears throat> I, I went over there, I present to him, and then he, he told me, well, you're, you're going to be in the, in the second year. And I will be asking you of, about the airplane, which type, or how. So it's interesting because <clears throat> we went out almost every day from uh, sunrise to sunset and touring all the military units. But then <clears throat> I remember that uh, one of these times, uh, it was a F-101 Buddha flying uh, over us. <clears throat> and the, then came a Crusader and uh, another F-101. Uh, they were flying, uh, low flying everywhere. And then he, he asked me, uh, what possibility do we have to shut down the supply? I said, none. What? No, we don't have any. 
Then uh, why? Sorry, because the, the radar are in the hand of the Soviet. We don't have radar. We only have the plane. And uh, we can do war plan based on chance or hope or on prayer. We do <coughs> a war plan based on facts. And the facts are that we don't have a uh, then, what for do, do we have, do we want a, an Air Force? Say, say <clears throat> sir, to avoid another Bay of Peak, but not without a command and control possibility not to confront the, the most powerful nation in the world. Say, so, oh. then uh, <clears throat> we kept going. We went to San Antonio, <laughs> Eiffel Base, and uh, we had 20 anti-aircraft battery there, 50, uh, 57 uh, millimeters, 37, uh, 14.5, 30 millimeter duplex, hundreds of guns. And then uh, 20 battery and, uh, and we went to the commanding post. Then he asked me, do you think that we have enough, uh, enough gun to shut down and repel uh, an attack? I say, oh, I, I think so. The only thing is that we are going to be shutting down uh, our plane and, and, the, and the other side plane. We are going to be shut, so shutting down here. Why? Let you, sir, look at, uh, look at that table. Do you think that we, with those magneto telephones from the uh, Second World War, do we, can we have a, a command and control of all the battery? And uh, then he, he looked at the, the, those old telephones. We had one telephone with, uh, with each battery, 20. Uh, and then he said, OK, one zero in the frame. But then uh, <clears throat> he called, uh, he said, put me the, the Minister of Interior on the phone. Because he's, he's such, he, he was, he really, uh, <clears throat> and then he, uh, they, they bring the, the, the R401, that's a, a radio communication with the Minister of Interior, and, and he told him, hey, immediately send me 21 patrol car with a cop inside. I say, I think this, this guy's crazy. And the Minister of Interior said, but, but, Sir, what about the crime? <laughs> if we take from, from the street 21 patrol cars, who knows? And then he said, Don't worry. Maybe tomorrow, day after tomorrow, we, will, we won't be here. And, and, and then, <laughs> Don't worry about crime. So uh, one hour later, we have 20, uh, 21 uh, patrol car entering the base, and uh, and he, you know what he did? He put one patrol car in each battery with a cop there, and then one in the in, in the commanding post. Then he made a closed circuit with the micro of the of the patrol car, and the, and the, and there was immediately a, a, a closed circuit, and he, he resolved the problem. And then uh, when he finished, say, we are die one, one on one, because <laughs> I was telling him always the, the the problem that I see, and uh, but the the most difficult day was the the 27. The 27, uh, we were in in the bunker inside, okay. and the, the news came that the, the, the Soviet shot, uh, shot down the U-2 uh, of Major Rodolf Anderson. And he said, oh, he was very concerned. He said, well, maybe tomorrow this will be it. Now the ball game has changed. <clears throat> and uh, he, uh, he ordered uh, to the, the <clears throat> guy from the Navy and, and and me to communicate the unit to be ready for the next day that expect anything, expect the 
a very hard reaction from the United States. So uh, that night was terrible, and for me it was more difficult because the the tunnel or where the the bunker was in in the middle of Havana, it, that was a cliff close to a river, the Armendariz River, that's, that uh, is close to, to the bay, to the sea. But the, the neighborhood above the, the commanding post was my home, and my kids were over there. And of course, I, I spent weeks, I couldn't go home, but I said, well, if, if they attack me, everybody's gone. Then, that night, I have a, <coughs> a bad dream. I, I was there and uh, a nightmare that, that everything have happened, and we went out and was nothing. <laughs> nothing was. Oh my God! But then some the, the, the guy from the navy woke me up and uh, and he said, "Hey, the, the, the commander in chief is uh, in a meeting with the Soviet. Let's go to listen <laughs> what is going on." <laughs> And then the, the Soviet <coughs> say, well, the, that the order didn't, didn't came from, uh, didn't come from, from uh, Moscow, and not even the, the commander of the Soviet troop in Cuba order was the deputy chief, the Lieutenant General Greshko. I don't know what happened to him. He ordered the shutting down, and I think that. Uh, thanks to, to the coolness of President Kennedy, that, that he was cool, he realized that realized that it was not crucial. They give a little bit more chance for, to diplomacy, and that uh, and, and that event, the 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 shutting down, was the the key moment where crucial and Kennedy realized that the, the situation was getting out of hand. Because if uh, one person that, uh, uh, that was even uh, the, the deputy chief of the Soviet uh, shot down an airplane, that's, that, uh, that was getting out of hand. So they at least, they, they cut a deal. Uh, well, Kennedy promised a place not to invade Cuba and Cuba and, and Khrushchev agreed to uh, take, it, take back the, the missile to the Soviet Union. And, fi and then, when Fidel Castro knew about the, the decision behind his back, oh, I can say the word that he yeah. said there. <laughs> and the four letter word. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and even I, I remember that it was four. Soviet general there in the bunker, and uh, and the four I agree with him. I say, what, what is this? <laughs> because for discipline, they at least they have to show their mouth, and because that was a political situation there. And <clears throat> and Fidel say, don't you agree that uh, <laughs> that Khrushchev is this and this and this? <laughs> I say, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a chicken. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's. And then, well, uh, thanks God that, that everything ended that way. And, and, and after that, uh, in, when the, the, the crisis was over, he, he surprised me because I, I was the, the commander of a squadron, of MiG-19 uh, squadron. And next week, I received the order to, uh, that I, I have been appointed commander of the Eastern Air Force region with the main base in, in, in Olguin. And I was catapulted from the commander of the squadron to the commander of the region. So uh, <coughs> then he, <coughs> I went to see him and then uh, he said, well, I am going to appoint you over there. We are going to give you a new brand a, a, a force base just built with a shelter for the airplane, with the everything, and uh, I, I, I am going to give you two squadron of MiG-15, 12 aircraft, each one, four MiG-15 UT, the 
uh, to two cities. I'm going to give you a regiment of anti-aircraft artillery, uh, the battalion of uh, Ryder. It was in the hand of, of the Soviet, but they are going to, to pass it to us in, in, in a few weeks. So go there and, and assess what you need. I went to Olguin, and I see, yeah, the wrong way, taxiway, shelter, aqueduct, two power plant, and where are the barrack? No. <laughs> so the Soviet that were the, were living tent. So I went back and said, sir, uh, yeah, it's nice, wrong way, nice taxiway, but. Uh, where are the barrack? How is it? No problem. I'm going to give you the, the financial uh, money, so you build the barrack yourself. <laughs> Say, but, so I have to be uh, build, uh, become a, a contractor, a, the commander of the base, and the pilot, uh, the instructor, because uh, ah, that's another thing. Uh, <clears throat> and where are the pilots? Say, no problem. Uh, you are just to, uh, going to receive 12 pilots from the Soviet Union and 12 from, from China. Okay. I get the, the record of the pilot and uh, they, they only had to fly, uh, flown solo and they had a, 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 the, the one from the China, they, they came with 15 hours oh. and the other one <laughs> from the Soviet Union, they came with 25 hours. That's <laughs> nothing. So say, well, I, I will be the contractor, the commander of the base, the instructor, and because I, I think that there are not instructors, uh, so they, uh, it's okay, you prepare them. <laughs> and I have to, in, in two years, you know what I have to do? I, I, <clears throat> I have to fly every day, I put four MiG-15 uh, UT, and when I, when I received this pilot, I, I, I was doing, yeah, almost nine and ten fly, uh, training fly, during, uh, during the day, and then in the afternoon, another one, the whole week. That, that was exhausting, and, but I, I didn't have one uh, single accident. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's pretty impressive, sir. <laughs> sir, transition, in 1964, you had the opportunity to receive flying training in the Soviet Union, and you also had the opportunity to attend to the Yuri Gagarin Air War yeah. College. Yeah. Can you tell us about your experience and uh, what was basically the main focus on the, of the education in the Soviet Union at that time? Yes, well, okay. <clears throat> uh, 